It's time. It's time for the Billy. For the Billy. Billy Flynn experience. Thank you so much for joining me once again. For the Billy Flynn experience. I am Billy Flynn. Hope everyone is having a wonderful, wonderful weekend or had a wonderful weekend. We are here coming live in Germany or coming live here from Germany. We're going to get into the schedule podcast for tonight. Of course, it is nighttime here in Germany. And it might be daytime or afternoon wherever you are in the rest of the world. But once again, thank you so much for joining me. It is such a pleasure. And as I always say at this time, if you got them, light them up because we're going to set the mood right. Oh, that's good. That's good. Okay, let's get it going. Let's get it popping. I was uh, viewing a very, very interesting documentary on uh, YouTube. And as a title of tonight's show is all the players in the game this is more or less a reaction to the I have to say a wonderful wonderful pod, uh, not podcast but a wonderful wonderful documentary which was done very very well by Easy es daughter E.B. Wright I have to give uh, all props As a matter of fact Let's give her some applause She represented Her father Very well I have to give it to her on that. And this, of of course, I have to say, rest in peace, Easy e Eric Wright. And this is in no way, shape, or form a disrespect. But this is my reaction to the uh, documentary in which I viewed earlier today. And I just had to talk about it. Once again, his daughter, E.B. Wright. And she was basically focusing the documentary around the untimely death of Eze. e uh, In particularly how he died supposedly of AIDS. And you have a lot of different people uh, in different camps that that would almost say they beg to differ because of how it all unfolded, how it all took place. And like everyone else, I'm a great fan of Easy es music. And what he contribute to the culture of hip hop and music in general. I mean, if it wasn't for Easy 
Eric Wright, Easy E. There wouldn't have been no NWA. There wouldn't have been no Dr. Dre. There wouldn't have been no Ice Cube. Okay, well, maybe I don't know. Maybe they. Maybe I'm stretching it a bit. Maybe Dr. Dre would have came out eventually. Maybe Ice Cube would have took another path. Who's to say? But I'm saying if it wasn't for Eric Wright, Easy E, there wouldn't have been no NWA. Let's get that straight. Let's get that. Let's put that out on on Front Street. So everyone would know. Got to give him props and respect. Now, with that said, I have to be honest, because as I was watching the uh, documentary, there were some things that E.B. Wright, uh, Easy es daughter, she made aware of certain instances in his life. And Eric writes Easy es life, which had me questioning. Now, I don't know, or I should say, I'm not a conspiracy theorist. Let's just, let's make that let's put that out there. Also, I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I don't get all off into that, you know, the talk on or the talking points. on things behind a person's death or a person's lifestyle or the way that certain things operate within an industry. But one thing I can say for sure, the music industry is demonic. They operate on some really dark spiritual energy and that is this it is what it is it's a business there's a lot of money at stake and they have people in the industry that have their own agendas and that's fact but once again I have to say one more time, this is in no disrespect towards Eric Wright or Easy es legacy and what he brought forth in hip hop or the hip hop culture and the music industry. I cannot say that enough. But again, as the title says, All the players in the game, because as I sat and I started reading, doing other research from what E.B. Wright said in the uh, documentary on YouTube, which you can view it on YouTube is on YouTube. So you can just look in the search engine and uh, just type in Easy E documentary and it'll pop up. But it's very interesting and it's very informative, but. I don't know. I guess I kind of com- uh, compiled an, a list of different players that are like it's like the strings are interwoven. They're all attached, and you know it's like you have Dr. Dre, you have Jerry Heller, you have Suge Knight. I mean, right down to Notorious B.I.G., Tupac, and Sean Combs, Diddy. And it seems as though these characters are crossing each other's paths during the 90s. One way or another. And it's just very, very interesting when you start breaking this stuff down and again like I say I'm not a conspiracy theorist I don't believe in all that bullshit but one thing I do know is that as it is said the devil 
is in the details. Okay, so let's take it from the top. Eazy-E and Dr. Dre formulated NWA. One of the best hip-hop groups out of the 90s. Very influential. Very powerful with their message and their music and with Dr. Dre behind the production it would never be another group like that or at least in our generation those that grew up in the 90s but once again another thing is that one thing that E.B. Wright Easy's daughter said is that she reached out to Ice Cube and he decided that he didn't want no part of the documentary and I find that very interesting but be that as it may who knows maybe he doesn't you know he doesn't want to bring up old you know emotions feelings or anger or whatever that's his that's his choice I can respect that but I find it very interesting to say the least okay so we have Again, Dr. Dre, Eazy-E, N.W.A. And the reason that I was, as, as I was reading and getting different information about the documentary, and like I said, the devil's in the details. It's always the little small things that, that just pops up. If you pay attention, it's there in your face. And again, like I said, the music industry is is very dark. It's it's almost it's almost it's macabre. It's very demonic. It's, it has has very like almost negative energy. There is some positivity. There is some positive aspect of it. But if you go back and you with a discerning mind objectively looking at it and listening to the music it's it's very dark because it's telling a story about uh the black culture if there is such a word but it's talking about the black experience in america it's talking about experiences that African Americans, black people in America, what we what we what we have gone through and what we continuously go through within our communities. And again, like I said, uh it's very interesting because once again you have the connecting points, or you have the ind- you know, different individuals that are connected to this, and you have Jerry Heller. <laughs> Which became a very, very interesting figure at the height of NWA's fame. So you have Jerry Heller comes in and everybody knows the story. I know this. I'm not saying anything new. Everybody knows the story. But what I'm trying to point out is the very the, the, the intricacies. And again, I was looking at one of the things that that E.B. Wright was talking about and she was saying uh, how Eric how, how Easy E. Eric Wright had enemies that wanted him dead. Right. And I was like, wow, it's like, that's very interesting because it was some of the things she was saying she was and it, it made me think about. It made me think about that one particular night. That. Suge Knight was on Jimmy Kimmel and he made that flammatory statement. About Easy E, And. How you can actually 
kill someone by injecting them with the AIDS virus. I, you know, I had to I had to go back and listen to it again because, I, like I said, that was a long time ago, and I didn't, you know, it was like further from my mind. But when she was saying that there was enemies that Easy E had that probably wanted to do him harm, I had to go back and research, and you know, I just listen to this. So they got this new thing out that people sell them all the time. They got this stuff to call. They get blood from somebody with AIDS. Yeah. And then they shoot you with it. Oh, so well, that seems happen, bad. You know, that's yeah. a slow death. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Easy, easy thing, you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> oh, no. Okay. Crazy. Insanity. And I guess we all can agree that Suge Knight, he's a psychopath. Some would say that, you know, he... he he was a good person he he looked out after his artist or he looked out after certain people but i i would say he did that for his own gain gains he was looking out for himself but when that when i listened to that particular audio I just kept asking myself, like, why, why would anybody say something this stupid like that? And I don't know. Maybe Suge Knight was being a troll. Maybe he was joking. Maybe he just wanted to just stir up. Because during that interview, that was he was on his way down. He wasn't as powerful as he used to be. So he was on his way out anyway. So I don't know. Maybe he wanted to just stir the pot, upset people. But then again, the devil's in the details. Maybe there is some truth behind it. But what I find very interesting. Going back to NWA. And again, this is no disrespect. On Easy es legacy, but I have to I have to I have to I have to bring this out. But I was going through. The discography, the different music that N.W.A. produced. And it was this one particular album. And I remember when it came out. And it was called uh, Niggers for Life. Niggas for Life. Niggas for Life. So it's. Uh, N.I.G.G.A.Z. For Life. And I remember that particular track if you listen to it and Dr. Dre the way he produced it instead of having it in your face it was backwards so niggas for life was backwards and that kind of played into what how creative Easy E was because he used to write a lot of things backwards he used to you know write in code and write things backwards so Niggas for Life was actually spelled backwards on the note sleeve of the album when albums used to be made, albums and cassette tapes. So I was looking at it and I was looking at the spelling and it it's the, when it's spelled backwards, it's E, capital E, F, I, L, number four, Z, A. G G I N. So I'm looking at it. I'm looking at it. I'm looking at it. I'm like, wow, that's, that's very interesting. So I said, okay, let me let me look that up. What what is what is Ethan? Ethan, Ethan, Ethan. So okay, I, you know, got on the computer and started, you know, playing with the word. Sure enough, there is a word. It's called Ephalism. And basically the meaning of it, it's anti-natalism. And it's actually a a philosophy behind that. It's a social movement and they believe that there is a negative value to birth. So it's basically saying it's anti-life. And again, like I said, if you, you know, 
It's the opposite. It's like duality. So you have life, but you spell it backwards. Well, life is to bring forth creation. To spell it backwards, Ephil is the opposite of that. It's to take away life or not to even produce life. It uh, creates a void. So that was that was the first thing that was like, I was like, wow, I didn't even know that. I was like, that's very, very interesting. Right. So I'm like, OK. Mm-hmm. OK. You know, well, it, as an artist, like many other artists, you know, we we create our work based on a lot of different things. It can be it can be something um, hidden messages hidden within it it could be uh, a play of words or it could be just telling a, a completely different story that we generate within ourselves so being an artist and, and operating out of the right side of your brain it can be very complex but nonetheless like I said the devil is always in the detail. It's always the small things, but it's right in your face if you want to see it. So I was like, wow, OK, all right. So we will go over to Jerry Heller. Rest in peace, Jerry Heller, because, again, if it wasn't for Jerry Heller, you know, you got to you got to give him props because he was the one who actually brought N.W.A. out of the garage or out of the bedroom, out of the basement into the mainstream. So he, you know, you have to give him his props on that. But again, like all psychopaths that own corporations or that run corporations, Jerry Heller was a psychopath. He didn't care nothing about anybody but himself. And that was incident. Incident behind that is the reason that Ice Cube left. Maybe that's why Ice Cube didn't want to be a part of the documentary because he just wants to forget about all of it. Maybe Ice Cube saw some things. And he wanted to just get away from it. So Ice Cube leaves N.W.A. when Jerry Heller steps into the picture and soon after Dr. Dre leaves also. But of course, Dr. Dre left based on contracts and money. Well, the same thing Ice Cube left, but Ice Cube was the first one who seen it. So I have to give Ice Cube props because he was smart enough or he had a lawyer. He was smart enough to get an entertainment lawyer when everybody else in the group of NWA didn't. They were going solely on what Jerry Heller was saying. So you have that situation that unfolded. And like I said. Things. The fabric the strings, the different connecting aspect of the different people. And they keep, you know, weaving in and out throughout the nineties. They keep crossing paths. So in step, Suge Knight, you know, everybody knows the story that Suge Knight was a bodyguard. Okay. Dr. Dre goes to Suge Knight and they start death row. But the one thing that really one one thing that really, again, stands out is that all of these these names of albums and groups and companies. Well, I want to say groups. I would definitely say corporations, names of the companies, these record companies and the name of these records that they they're dark, very, very dark, very macabre. It's like almost bad energy. So he, Dr. Dre should night starts death row. Death Row, of course, moves to Interscope to get a distribution deal. 
again. Here we are with the weaving in and out. Fast forward, Dr. Dre falls out with Suge Knight. He moves over to Interscope to start his own aftermath. At the same time, Tupac comes up on the scene. So now you have Tupac, you have Snoop Dogg, you have the Dog Pound, and they're like the front runners in Death Row. Okay, so now you have a situation that before, actually, before Dr. Dre leaves Death Row, Suge Knight goes to Jerry Heller and Easy E to get Dr. Dre released from the contract with Ruthless, Ruthless Records. So they released him from his contract. So now Dr. Dre was with Death Row, and then soon after. Dr. Dre decided he wants to leave death row, moves over to Interscope. <clears throat> while at the same time, death, dro, death, dro, death row has a distribution deal with Interscope. Now. What next that comes up? Is that once Tupac signs a deal with Death Row, he becomes like the major artist. So now you have Tupac, Death Row, and Death Row being the the leader or the the top record label during that time. The top. Towering over bad boys, towering over all other the all, all the other smaller black labels but they were the top and I didn't really want to make this podcast this long but I just find it very very interesting so just kind of hang out with me and listen to this because this is very it's going to get interesting so you have Tupac going back and forth from LA to New York and of course Biggie Small comes in the picture Tupac and Biggie Small becomes they were they were were best of friends in, in in the beginning. So you have Biggie Smalls with Bad Boy Records, Diddy. So now Diddy comes in the picture, and this is where things get really interesting, because now you have Death Row, Bad Boys. And they're at each other's throat. So what do they do? They pit their artists against each other. And. Again. Because of the fact this started with NWA. And I'm trying to draw, you know, the lines to to make all of this. Understandable, because it seems as though all of it is connected. All the players are connected. All the players had something to do with the death of Biggie Smalls, Christopher Wallace, Tupac Shakur, and I would even say Eric Wright, Easy E. Because like I said, Suge Knight made that inflammatory statement on Jimmy Kimmel which everybody was shocked that he would say something as stupid as that. And maybe who knows the truth is going to come out. Sooner or later, the truth will come out as long as people will continue to do these documentaries and keep putting the information out there. There are certain things that are going to pop up to other individuals that they're going to do their own research and they're going to all put two and two together. That's how I look at it. But anyways, so you have the situation with. With Tupac and Biggie Smalls, of course. Again, Eric Wright, Easy e he he succumb 
to the AIDS virus. And again, like I said, that was a mystery. That was a shocker because people that was very close to Eric Wright, Easy e they doubted it from the start. But the way that it was put out into the public arena is that based on his lifestyle, dealing with a lot of different women, having a lot of unprotected sex, Allegedly, it's not proven, but this is what the mainstream kind of like put two and two together. Well, he was very promiscuous. He didn't care about using protection. He was in a very famous hip hop group at the height of their popularity and he lived his life fully. So this is what happened. But again, like I said, from the people that was very close to him. They, of course, had questions. They didn't believe it. And it's understandable. Because you have a situation like with these artists that are connected to these major record labels. And I'm not saying that this is what they're doing. These CEOs and executives that own these labels. I'm not saying this is this is their main focus is to do away with their artists but you have billions of dollars that can be earned and like I said it's no surprise that most of the people that are heading these corporations are psychopaths they don't give a shit about nobody but themselves I'll give you an example Came across another interesting uh, YouTube individual. Goes by the name of uh, Gene The Deal. The Real Deal. Okay. Gene The Real Deal. He was a bodyguard of Mr. Combs during the height of Bad Boys Records. And he's been on YouTube. He's been on the internet on YouTube. I don't know for the past 10. uh, I would say maybe last seven years, seven, eight years. And he's coming. He he tells these interesting stories about his experiences with being the bodyguard for Mr. Combs, Puffy. And as he tells a story, it became more and more interesting because he, he would, you know, he have it off and he would tell the stories in, in, in sections and it would just like kind of bring you into what he's saying and you it's compelling some of the information that he was saying. And it was this one particular time. And this is a couple of years ago. He was he was giving a uh, he was giving an uh, an interview. I forget what platform he was on, but he was giving an interview. And this is what he was saying. This is what he said. This is this very 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 shocking. But listen to this. And then Puff came back downstairs. He was heated. He said, "Yo, Gene, I got 126 employees, and these people depend on me for their livelihoods." If these white folks thought or they would think that I had anything to do with any kind of gunplay, they wasn't going to fuck with me and they not going to fuck with me. He said, "Um, I'm a businessman. I'm about making money, but something got to change. I don't give a fuck if Pac got to die, Big got to die, or Suge Knight go to jail. Something's got to change. And he took upstairs he took he turned around and walked back upstairs and it didn't dawn on me what he said and then my man looked at me and Bum was like yo that nigga said big I said yo he sure did he said yeah he said big gotta die he said yo he said big interesting and like I said all this this is all on on YouTube it's out there. So I'm not making any of this up. 
this is out there. All you have to do is go on the search engine and just type in Jean Dill Puffy Biggie. And you're, you're, you'll find it. Some of them have longer interviews and some of them are like clips where you can just like actually just hit the clip and it'll play. But this is one of those clips. And again, this is not saying I'm not saying that Mr. Combs had anything to do with Biggie's death or had anything to do with Tupac's death. I'm not saying that Suge Knight had anything to do with Easy E's death. But again, the devil is in the details. It just it, it's right there. People making inflammatory statements that later comes back to haunt them. And I find it very, very interesting also. And compelling to say that Mr. Combs all of a sudden has discovered God or thereof facsimile. But he's become this all about positivity and spreading love and inspiration. And that's fine. As we grow older, it happens or it should happen. But again, it's almost like a duality. You live this lifestyle, this hedonistic lifestyle of materialism, women, substance abuse, and then you flip it. And it happens just at a time where things are like, you know, we're living in a time and we're living in an age now where information is at our fingertips. We can get the information. And like I said, if people start putting two to two and two together. And then not only that, but it's just like, look at how people are living. Just look at, you know, we're living, you know, everything is on front street, social media. People put their lives on social media. They're telling a story. They're telling that story about their lives. It's all on social media. And like I said, it just takes the right individual to just kind of like see it, put two and two together. And it's like, boom, the truth is right there in front of you. But again, like I said, I'm not saying and I have to keep putting it out there. I'm not pointing the fingers that Sean Puffy. Combs had anything to do with Biggie Small's death and he had nothing to do with Tupac's death same thing with Suge Knight I'm not saying that they had anything to do so that is my disclaimer but all I'm saying is that the devil is in the details so be that as it may but again like I said Applause goes out to Easy es daughter, E.B. Wright. She did a wonderful job on the documentary. It's worth watching. It's very informative. And I would just like direct everyone to go and just check it out because it's, it's very good. She did a wonderful job. So that's it for the podcast. I'm sorry to kind of talk so much because as I always said, I want to keep my my podcast less than 15 minutes, but this was a very, very important podcast to me because of the fact, like I said, I am a music junkie. I love music. I love all different forms of music and hip hop is one of them. And from watching her, from watching E.B. Wright's documentary about her father and his legacy, Easy es legacy, it just, you know, I just had to, I had to just, kind of just put it out there from the information and what I started picking up on. So anyways, thank you so much for joining me. Look forward to being with you again. Have a wonderful, wonderful 
safe start of the week. And God bless. Talk to you soon. <laughs>